So insurance has always been one of those, those tricky subjects that quite frankly, nobody really likes to talk about. And it's one of the things that uh, unfortunately you have to buy it before you need it. But today we're gonna walk through some of the different types of insurance, some of the features and discuss strategies for how you can think about it um, in, in, in your own life. So just before we jump in um, a little bit about about Fort Pitt Capital Group. Um, you know, on behalf of the entire firm, you know, we're pleased to offer these series of webinars. Um, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Fort Pitt, we're an investment management firm um, and financial planning firm that was founded in 1995. Um, and I think a few of the things that make us unique, number one, we make all of our investment decisions and do all of the financial planning work that we do for clients in-house. Unlike a lot of industry trends, we don't farm it out to a third party. So you're really able to work with the people that are making the decisions and doing the planning with you. I think secondly, we, we take a team approach, um, which really provides clients with, with a boutique feel um, that they're, they really know the advisors and the teams they're working with, with directly. And I think third, we take a holistic approach with every client relationship. And that involves not just managing clients' money, but custom retirement planning, working with clients in, in all aspects of their financial lives, whether it be social security or charitable giving or estate planning or things like insurance. So although clients predominantly come to us for portfolio management, um, we, we go so much deeper in, in the relationship. And just a little bit about our webinars. Um, if you've not attended these in the past, we really have designed them to be educational and, and touch on the areas of our clients' lives that are important to them. Um, again, we've done webinars on things like Social Security, Medicare planning, estate planning, um, really kind of runs the gamut. And we leverage the expertise, not just of the people that we have here at Fort Pitt in-house, but also other advisors. We have attorneys, we have accountants, we have uh, you know, Medicare specialists that join us. So with that being said, um, we'll just take a couple of minutes and, and Miles and I can, can introduce ourselves. Like I mentioned, my name's Brad Newman. Just some quick background on me. I'm a certified financial planner. Uh, with Fort Pitt. I've been working with clients for over 25 years, helping them quantify and, and meet their financial goals. I'm located here in Harrisburg, PA, in our central PA office. Um, I'm married with two children. One is a very recent college graduate, which is fantastic. That means no more tuition payments for her. The other is a rising senior, so we only have, I think, two more payments on him. And for today's discussion, as you'll see, I'm going to be playing the role of the transitional or mid-stage uh, of life guy. So uh, for today, I'm, I'm the old guy in the conversation. Um, <laughs> Miles, do you, you want to share a little bit about your background? Certainly. Yep. So my name is Miles Clements, uh, born and raised, you know, about 45 minutes east of Pittsburgh, the New Kensington, Lower Borough area. Um, I've been interested in finance, you know, investing, financial planning. Um, you know, since my since my early years, my my uh, my uncle was actually a day trader, um, and I used to often go to his house over the summer and just kind of watch him and learn from him. And he would often give me books. So this is something that I've been very interested in and kind of fascinated with at a very young age. Um, it's probably one of the only things besides fishing um, that I've never become bored with, and I, I've always remained interested in. Um, you know, Brad, I know you've got two kids that are kind of towards the the end of the they're coming off the income statement and the balance sheet. Um, I have a three-year-old son um, and a daughter that's due here uh, next month, so my journey is just beginning. Um, and I can tell you, I, I don't know if it's if this always reigns true, but I, I think the cuter they are, the more expensive they are, because because my son is uh, he's quite pricey at this point. So I, I think I, I have a long uh, a long road ahead um, with with them. Um, and for today's purposes, I'll be playing the role of someone that has a young family, um, typically has a lot of things going on, you know, not just monetarily, but um, just life is very busy at this stage. Um, and I think that oftentimes this is one of those stages in life that's most overlooked. And that when we do see things pop up from a financial planning perspective um, of those, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda moments, this is often when they happen. 
this is when someone should have honestly sat down with a certified financial planner, you know, with someone like, you know, like Brad or myself, and really looked at what their needs were going to be and addressed, you know, their insurance concerns, you know, at that time. Um, you know, I have run into to instances through clients, um, you know, who have relatives, for example. Um, there was one not that long ago. Um, gentleman had three kids. He had a massive stroke. Was 40 years old in his peak, you know, starting to reach his peak earning years, um, and passed away unfortunately. And there was not enough life insurance, you know, in that picture. So I, we have some some realistic, I think, examples to discuss today uh, with, with everyone, and we're looking forward to it. And, yeah. and also, before we get too far into the webinar today, as a follow up to all the things that Brad and I are going to discuss with you, we're going to include an email that's going to have on what we call one pagers. One pagers are just a nice, short, easy to digest summary for all the types of insurance that we're going to discuss. It is not a one-stop solution for you to find you know, an answer for every single question, but it is a really good place to start um, because we're gonna talk about a lot of things today. So we wanna make sure we provide everyone that's attended and even those that maybe couldn't have attended but did register with that information. Yeah, that's great, Miles. And those, there's, good, there's good stuff on those one-pagers. Absolutely. Um, and as well, again, before we get too far in, just to how to interact with the webinar today, um, as you're logged into to the device, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there's going to be a couple of boxes there. Um, and when we get to the Q&A section, you'll be able to, to answer, you know, to ask questions. And Brad and I have time set aside here today to address them. And if anything, it's complicated. We will follow up with you, you know, after today's webinar um, to address those things further. Um, as we know, when it comes to not just insurance planning, but you know, investment planning, wealth planning, uh, no two cases are alike. Sometimes there are similarities. So we want to make sure we use that Q&A time to address probably some very common questions and concerns that we receive you know, fairly often. Perfect. So we're going to start at a little bit of a higher level before we get into the details on the insurance. And this is really one of my favorite pictures that we have. I, I always refer to it as the wheel. And I think it's a great starting point for a conversation on holistic financial planning, which is really one of our core um, you know, points of focus with clients. So these are the vast majority of the areas that we help clients with. You know, we typically at the onset of a relationship, we're, we're not going to tackle every single one of those, but the two, three, four that are the most important, the most germane. And there may be some of these that don't pertain to a client ever. But our focus, and Miles, I don't know if you want to go to the next slide where there's a little bit of commentary, you know, on each of these, but our real focus is, is kind of being your financial quarterback. You know, we want our clients to call us when they have anything going on in their lives financially, whether it has to deal with estate planning or income planning or insurance or what have you that even if we're not the right people to address the issue, we can get you to the right people um, that were, uh, you know, very good as far as, you know, being that sounding board to say, well, you know, this is a good issue, a good item to talk about, but we really need to get you together with your attorney or with your accountant, or maybe it's something we can help with directly. So I think this is a good kind of starting point as we you know dive into uh, the discussion on insurance and, and brad to that point you, it was very well said i think one of the the big misconceptions when working with you know a team such as ours and working with with planners and people that do things in-house you know we are your partner so money today is far more complicated than it was 20 years ago and it's far more complicated today than it was 50 years ago. And if that trend continues, it will be more complicated 20 years from now than it is today. And for those of us that aren't ingrained in this world, like Brad and I and the team at Fort Pitt are, if you're just trying to live your life, save for retirement, manage all the, the hectic things that life can throw at you, we often see a lot of this stuff get thrown to the wayside. And it's not because someone doesn't care, but we only have so much bandwidth. You know, there's a reason why when I get hurt or I don't feel good, I go to the doctor. My degree is not in medical science. I don't know the first thing about that. So I go to the expert and say, hey, here's what I'm feeling. Can you help me diagnose this problem and then help me find a solution? And so that's really what I think, you know, for Pit, we pride ourselves in is providing our clients with, with 
easy to manage you know steps and advice and we're here with you along the way so we don't just give somebody one of these plans and just send them out into the ether we're here to help you from the forever you know that's that's the the ultimate goal that we have for all of our clients because like i said money is complicated and i, I don't think that's going to change yeah. and the other point miles is you know to be there where we're chatting multiple times throughout the year getting together once a year and checking in how are we doing on these things what progress have we made and what new things have come up so i think that's, that, perfect. It, it, that's a that's a big point life is not linear right we all like to think that you know here we are from the day we're born and here we are when we die and it's just a nice straight line that's not how life works life is hectic that line is moving constantly and so as those changes are happening having a partner involved I think helps bring some calmness to the storm that that is life. And like I said, I have a three-year-old at home, so I'm I'm learning that things aren't getting less hectic; they're getting more hectic. And adding a second kid to this equation, I think will we'll make it will make it even more hectic. So I'm I'm getting firsthand experience in trying to be everything to everyone at all times. It's just it's not possible. So people need help, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, get ready, buckle up. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about insurance. Perfect. So I think one of the, the most common questions that, that I receive from people that I'm meeting with, you know, existing clients, even, even you know, new, new possible clients, when we start talking about insurance is why do I need insurance? Miles, I see all these commercials on TV, you know, you should have $5 million of life insurance. You should have, you know, you should have this annuity. You should have long-term care. I just feel like I'm being sold something. So why do I actually need this insurance? And I think it's a valid question. I honestly do, because I think that for a long time, as insurance was developing in the financial world, it has morphed and changed into many different, different vehicles and different solutions. What we try to do is, is really simplify those solutions down from one, making sure it meets, meets your goal, two, it's at a reasonable cost. Because, you know, Brad, I'm sure you see this as well. The cost of insurance has statistically gone down as we've lived longer. Is that correct? Correct. And so having thoughtful reviews of, of insurance and the needs of your insurance, I think is critically important. And so when we're sitting down with someone and we're starting that planning conversation, addressing that question, why do you need insurance? There's typically two, two methods that we, that we use to analyze it. There's a couple others, but the two primary ones. The first one is human life value. And in a nutshell, what human life value means, it's essentially we take your life, who you are, the income, goals that we've set out for your dependents, retirement goals, addressing you know, debts that need to be paid off, and we attach a monetary sum to, the, to those items. This is not to say that your life is worth a million dollars. Your life is, is priceless, but for insurance purposes, there has to be a monetary value attached to that insurance. And oftentimes, this is where I see people make a lot of mistakes. For go back to my example, I'm 29 years old, my wife is 29 years old, we're gonna have two kids, we have a house, we have, a, we have cars, we have a dog that my wife says is our third child. There's a lot of things going on in our situation and what, God forbid something happens to me on my way home from work, then what's going to happen? Have we addressed through my financial plan, well, what's it gonna take to ensure that my, my family can go on without me? Because they're gonna be dealing with a, you know, a, an emotional hardship. What we don't wanna do is leave them with a financial hardship, as well as trying to address the emotional hardship. I've seen those two firsthand, it never ends well. So we can soften the burden on at least one of those things. This is where we start. We wanna make sure that, okay, Miles is no longer here. That's very sad. Um, my family will miss me. Brad, I'm sure you'll shed a tear for me as well, uh, which will be appreciated. But we sure. want to make sure that we can ensure that my house is paid for, vehicles are paid off, my wife and kids can maintain their same level of lifestyle that they've become accustomed to, while also ensuring that, you know, I want to make sure my kids can go to college. That is that is secure. I want to make sure that my wife can retire, you know, the way that we plan for her to. That I want that to be addressed. Now, for everybody, that's a little different, but just wanted to give you a realistic example of when we say human life value, that's the type of planning that we're doing. 
we're planning for in the event that something happens to you, we're able to address all the things you would have wanted to accomplish in your life that you're not, not maybe here to enjoy, but at least have the peace of mind knowing that the people that are going to live on with your legacy aren't left kind of empty handed on the financial side of things. The, uh, the second part of that planning process and kind of one of the areas we look at is, you know, risk mitigation. So yet again, this is that ongoing review of your insurance needs. In addition to realizing that sometimes it's not just that you might pass away, but what if you get injured at work? What if you're outside shoveling snow and you, you know, throw out your back and you, you can't move around anymore? Or God forbid you get hit by a bus and you're paralyzed from the neck down. You're still around. I mean, Social Security disability is only going to pay so much. You know, you know, hopefully you meet certain criteria to make those payments. Do you have the right disability insurance put in place? Um, do you have the right, you know, the right benefits through your employer plan, you know, in place? So we try to make this insurance analysis all encompassing so that we can review all of your needs and then figure out what that actual cost needs to be so that you're not being overcharged. You know, Brad, I think you can probably speak to this as well. How many times do we sit down with someone that maybe at one point in time addressed that human life value concern, but then didn't do the next part of having that risk mitigation and review process established to ensure that that was the correct amount of insurance they still needed. Maybe there's been a change or a decrease, right? Uh, maybe there's been some life changes. Maybe you've had more children. Maybe you've adopted another child. Maybe there's been some major life you know, adjustment that we need to now go back to the drawing board and review, or maybe just the cost of your existing insurance may have come down possibly. Um, so Brad, do you have any, any kind of any examples there you wanna maybe throw to the group? Yeah, and I think we're going to talk about that in more detail in a little bit, but that ongoing review is critical. And I always look at the kind of the human life value as the, you know, how much component and the risk mitigation is, you know, the how we do it. It's the what versus the how. And just to to, to circle back on the human life value, it's, it's always interesting to me that, um, a lot of people I don't think really fully understand that when you look at life insurance as an example, that human life value, it's not extra money. I think a lot of people think about that as, um, oh, well, probably a quarter million or half a million dollars of life insurance is plenty. And they're thinking in the back of their minds, what would I do with an extra quarter million or half million dollars? And I always encourage people to think about things like, um, like a wrongful death case, you know, where somebody was killed, you know, accidentally, there was negligence. The attorneys that handle those cases, you're always hearing them talk about multi-million dollar settlements. You know, so I put a little bit of math to it and said, if you've got a 35 year old person who theoretically has another 35 years to work and they're earning about, let's say $5,000 a month net spendable income, and if we apply just a very simple 2% cost of living adjustment, the end result is we probably need two, $3 million to replace their earnings. I just think um, part of that conversation and, and really Miles, why we do the analysis. It's not just us sitting here and saying, well, let's back of the napkin this, let's really go through it. Let's quantify things like paying off mortgages, like educating children, like replacing income. Let's put some inflation to this and then really come up with an answer, but to your point, and then review that on an ongoing basis. Well, that said. might be a nice segue to kind of just, you know, jump into the, to the life insurance side. Absolutely. So, so I, I think, oh, go ahead, Miles. Right, no, you're good. I, I think what Miles was saying is, you know, when you look at life insurance, um, especially for somebody in, in, in Miles' situation, I, I always look at kind of three components of, of what you want to consider at a high level. You know, the first is cover any debts you have or, or may occur, you know, you know incur in, in the near term. Two is replace income to, to somebody that's dependent on you, typically a spouse, typically children. And third, to educate your kids to whatever extent you know you want. Now, there are some other areas where you can look at, at life insurance needs, some, some of them for estate planning. Uh, sometimes it's to pay the actual estate taxes. Sometimes it's to create liquidity when you die, if you've got an illiquid estate, say a business or a lot of real estate. And sometimes it's what I refer to as estate equalization, where 
Um, maybe you have that real estate or that business and one or more of your kids are interested in taking that on, uh, but other kids aren't. So, you know, how do you, how do you equalize across, you know, the kids that you have for, you know, creating some cash for the non, non future business owners. And there's different types of insurance. Uh, Miles and I were talking about this the other day, you know, term insurance, which I, I like your phrase of temporary. Um, and permanent insurance, which is just how it sounds. And we spend a lot of time talking with people about matching the need to the term or the type of insurance. So you have a mortgage, 30 year duration, gosh, a 30 year term policy would probably work really well for that. You've got a brand new child, it's going to be 20 to 25 years until that child's either through school or, or you probably have the assets there accrued to send them to school, maybe a 20 or 25 year term policy for something like that. But when you look at some of the things like estate planning, estate equalization, maybe charitable planning, these are things where you're gonna have to have that insurance in force when you die. So that's where that permanent insurance um, comes into play. And as we'll talk about, that's gonna change as you move through life. That's well said, Brad. And I think one of the other pieces there with 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 you know life insurance, you know, either term or permanent. I think one of those pieces of matching the you know the the term to the need is also ensuring that correct beneficiaries are attached to these policies. You know, we have clients that have policies from eons ago that may be permanent, and they maybe at one point maybe listed a, a parent, but now they're married, they have children. Um, or they have grandchildren and they want to change some of this stuff. And so that goes back to that process of continuing to review where these types of insurance really fit into your overall picture um, and why it's important we have you have a process in place to do so. Um, sure. You know, in addition to you know life insurance, I think one of the, the big questions that, that I'm receiving you know, now is things around long-term care. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, Genworth Financial did a study back in 2021 and they had come up with that the median cost of a private nursing facility stay was about $108,000 a year, um, which is a significant amount of money. Um, that projection is really only supposed to go up because of inflation and just the cost of care. It's, it's become, I think, pretty much an unmanageable um, service for a lot of these institutions. And so what, what we'd like to do when we're looking at long-term care is very much the same thing with insurance. We want to make sure that we address that long-term care need with the right solution, the right strategy. And oftentimes it comes down to what's the type of benefit you're looking to receive in a length, length of stay. The average length of stay right now in a long-term care facility is about three to four years. Um, you can find policies out there that are much longer, but they're extremely costly. Um, some of the older types of long-term care policies that are out there, um, really have not worked out the way that they were supposed to because at the time the cost of staying in a long-term care facility was not what it is today and so the insurance industry certainly made some adjustments to the types of policies that are out there now in providing you with a lot more flexibility uh, to give you an example of this you know an old school long-term care policy if you bought one 20 years ago it was essentially like life insurance you're going to pay a premium and either you use it or you don't so if you're like my neighbor Howard, who says he's 98 years young and cuts his grass, it might take him all week, but Howard still gets around, he walks every single day and he's in great shape. If he has a long-term care policy, he's been paying for that for eons at this point and he's never going to use it. And so for a lot of people that really, I think left a bad taste in their mouth as a viable solution and an option to address long-term care. And so what we've seen from the insurance industry is they've now come out with different types of policies that allow flexibility. So instead of it just being, well, you paid this premium, hey, guess what? You, you happen to win that lottery of not ever needing to go into a long-term care facility during retirement. You've now lost that $12,000 a year you were paying you know, as, a, as an annual premium. It's gone forever. Now, maybe we can convert that to some type of life, you know, life insurance, permanent insurance. Maybe we can give you a, a return or a refund of the money that you paid right, which I think is a, is a great benefit. Now, not all insurance companies do this, but there are some out there that do. Um, and then there's others that say, look, as you need money for long-term care, 
will provide you with a spendable benefit. Now that spendable benefit may depend on a couple of different factors, um, and that's part of meeting on an individual basis. But I think as with anything, the longer this stuff has been around, you know, the, the, the less complicated it's become and the more viable those solutions are that are out there. And so that's, that's really the way we try to address long-term care. Um, we try to be flexible because life is not rigid. Things are going to change and develop over time. Um, and I think making sure that the types of insurance you have as you're kind of looking at long-term care you know, are critically important. Yeah, Miles, that's that kind of risk mitigation part you were talking about. Sometimes the end solution isn't mitigating all of the risk, but the majority of the risk or a large percentage of the risk. That has to be weighed against what the cost is. A absolutely, because you, you figure if you take a, I'll use a married couple as an example. If they both retire at 65, let's just assume they have a million dollars set aside for retirement. As we build that that retirement plan, we want to assume what if one of them were to need to stay in a long term care facility. Sometimes we even do both. Um, if there's maybe a family history, or it's just personal preference, you know, on the on the half of the client or the person we're building a plan for. Well, our number one objective and concern when addressing that long term care need is to ensure that if there is a stay in a long term care facility, what happens to that spouse that may not need to be in a long term care facility? Because what you don't want to see happen, and I can speak from this from personal experience, my great grandparents, um, you know, the time that they had come up and the time that they needed to be in a long term care facility, long term care insurance was not around um, in the current state that it is today. And so it was a really hard go for my great grandmother. I know that my grandparents had to help her kind of cover some of her bills and expenses, and they were in a place where they could financially do that, but, you know, they still were in limited means. And so we want to make sure that we are attaching the right type of insurance to that goal. And that goal in this example is to ensure that whatever spouse is not inside that long-term care facility can maintain their same lifestyle. And in some cases, we get a number that comes back that says, hey, there's actually enough money here based upon what you're getting from other factors like a pension or Social Security, um, that there's actually no need to, to spend more money on a long-term care policy. But in some instances, there are. And we want to make sure that we can address those when they do, when they do pop up. Yeah. And Miles, just one more thing before we move on from long-term care. I don't want to take the attention away from insurance, but just going back to that first illustration of the wheel, it's not just the long-term care insurance, but in that situation that you're describing, it's now saying, we need to get you to an elder care attorney. It's not just looking at long-term care insurance as a solution. It's how do we look at things more holistically? Exactly. And that type of and that and that type of conversation is one we're typically having with people long before we get to the point where we have to put someone in, in, a, in, a, in a care facility. We want to be proactive and get these things established and in place long before this becomes an issue, because typically once it becomes an issue, it's too late. You've yeah. missed planning opportunities. We've missed ways to be um, you know, to, to put some tax planning and tax strategies in place. And we accompany all that you know, like with an elder care attorney. And I would strongly recommend that um, if you're someone that's you know, looking for this type of insurance, you'll want to make sure you're working with an elder care attorney um, you know, as it comes to putting that elder care plan in place. Work with specialists. I think that's a critical element here. For sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about disability insurance. And this is a little more straightforward. There hasn't been near the um, evolution that we've seen in long-term care. But really, as Miles said, disability insurance is really there to replace your income when you can't work. And I think the moving pieces there as far as <clears throat> the cost of it are really a function of how soon does it start, something called an elimination period, how long do you have to wait be after becoming disabled until the insurance company starts to pay you a benefit, how long do the benefits last? And then how much insurance are you getting? How much are they going to pay you per month? I think the one thing that is really not talked about enough is, um, because it really is a pretty straightforward area, but, but the tax implications of that. And the most simplistic way to put it is, it goes back to who is paying the premium. So if you have a disability insurance policy through work and your employer pays for all of it, if you don't have any payroll deduction coming out, if you're not making any contributions to it, 
If you become disabled and start to receive benefits, those benefits are taxable. If you're the one paying the premium, either you're doing it directly with the insurance company or it's coming out of your paycheck, those disability benefits are tax-free. And the reason I think that's so important is if you have a disability benefit that typically through work coverage, they express it in terms of a percentage. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna pay 60% of your income. And if you earn $100,000, most people are thinking, oh, that's $60,000 a year. If that's a taxable benefit, that all of a sudden could turn into 40 or $45,000 a year. So one of the things I think people aren't necessarily aware of is they, they, they see that 60% of coverage, they think, oh, I'm gonna be fine. They don't realize it's gonna turn into 40, 45%. There's an opportunity for people to start to think about something supplemental. Do I want to essentially purchase some private insurance to make up the taxation? Um, but again, that's something that 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 we're chatting with 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 clients about. Well, Brent, and, and to that point, I think another piece of why we why we want to start with that with that plan is that taking into account not only today's tax rates, but you know how inflation will impact those tax rates over time, right? So we start with a, a shortfall. You know, let's say we you know I was making fifty thousand a year. Well, if I was paying for that, I become disabled. I didn't factor in taxation and all these other elements. Well, then what happens? What happens when that tax rate that I was, you know, projecting in the plan ends up, you know, bumping up, you know, two percent every couple of years? Soon you find yourself in a pretty deep hole that you you can't get out of. And, and that's one that we do run into from time to time uh, when someone comes to us with a problem, you know, around, you know, I've got this, I'm on disability and I, I'm having a hard time kind of meeting ends meet at this point. You know, I've been disabled for ten years now. Um, that's usually when, when we you know, we want to make sure we address that through a planning process. Yeah, yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, and then the other type of insurance is executive benefit, uh, you know, insurance. It, it's one that, as the name you know suffices to, really addresses business owner. Um, and the two most common types that that I run across are you know entity purchase agreements or, or cross purchase agreements. Typically with this type of insurance, it's designed to either keep the business intact or make owners and, and partners whole in the event that someone passes away. Um, it also can help with things like estate liquidity, um, you know, buyouts of, of, of existing partners, um, the addition of maybe possibly new partners. There's a lot of complexities here. And typically when we're addressing this type of, of planning, yet again, we wanna get a business attorney involved here to figure out, okay, who's responsible for making what payments, what benefits go to whom and, and as to why, we address that, that question as well. Because as you can imagine, if you've got a partnership with five people in it, um, there's a lot of probably you know, mixed matching of personalities, needs, family situations. So it's a very complicated type of insurance that we would strongly recommend somebody, you know, bring someone like us in, we bring a business attorney in, we sit down with everybody and really come up with a plan that works for all. Yeah. And Miles, I think the other side of that is, again, the disability side, what they often call business continuation, that will step in and provide money to keep the business going until you can figure out, are you coming back from that issue, whatever caused the disability, or give you enough time to sell the business in an orderly fashion. But in either case, I think the real goal of that business insurance uh, for either death or disability, it's, it's to avoid a fire sale. All right. Well, let's talk about life phases. Perfect. So, you know, life phases. So now that we've addressed, you know, getting a plan in place, addressing the why you need insurance, discussing the types of insurance. Now we're going to look at, you know, the life phases of insurance. And essentially what that really means at a high level is just putting all of this together. And when should we be discussing, you know, the types of insurance we, you know, we previously, you know, discussed. Um, so let me just jump here to the next slide. So you can see here, you know, on our graphical representation, you know, we look at you through your entire life cycle from someone that maybe is single and someone, then you become married, then you're married with children, married with grown children, then you're retiring. And the insurance needs and the types of planning that need to take place in each of these stages is different. For example, if someone is single, they really probably don't have many insurable risks. 
they don't have any kids. Maybe they have a house. Maybe they have some outstanding debt. So probably the need for, for the type of maybe life insurance someone needs um, is relatively small. But on the other hand, if they're single, there's no one around them to help support, there's probably a need for disability, right? They become injured or hurt on the job or just hurt in general. How are they gonna be able to pay their bills? How are they gonna be able to service their debt payments? How are they gonna be able to have income to provide for the care that they might need? Um, then you look at someone that's married. Um, and I'll give you the example of my wife and I, before we had kids, um, you know, we both work, both had insurance, but we had two cars, we had a mortgage together. Well, if something happens to my wife, Am I able to you know, facilitate making all those payments for all of these outstanding debts that are still out there if we own everything jointly? Um, yet again, same thing with disability insurance as well. What if one of us becomes disabled? So it, it kind of, if you think about this timeline as kind of a, their stepping stones that we slowly will add to over time. But on the other side of this, that's where would you kind of reach that peak of you're married with grown children or, or, you, know, or you have kids, as they get older, probably the needs for insurance come down. If you've been saving, you know, investing in addition to having the insurance, a lot of this stuff will probably decrease, you know, o over time as well. Brad, do you have any, any thoughts to add here? You know, I think maybe having it change is, is, is maybe even a better way to look at it. I think some of it will decrease, some other things may increase, but I think it's just the idea of that change. And I love this picture. It really, it really captures what we all go through and none of us go through it at the same rate in the same way but I, I i hate to keep coming back to the same point but this is why we're constantly meeting with talking with our clients that as their life situation changes um we're making adjustments to it i don't know if you want to flip to the next slide that kind of breaks things down into those three you know early stage uh mid stage and end stage but i think miles you know when i was in your stage it was really for example like you said disability really really important um life insurance trying to get as much as we could for as relatively small a premium because our dollars were you know being pulled so many other different directions i'm kind of in that transitional stage i'm in that mid stage so this is really um, you know, a great point for, I'll say a major reevaluation. Um, you know, kids are now through college or almost through college. Mortgages may or may not be, be paid off. Starting to think about what retirement really looks like. So from a life insurance perspective, I'm starting to think about what are the levels that I really need? Do I still need that insurance that I had when my kids were born to educate them? No, I don't. Um, do I maybe need to start thinking about some more permanent insurance? Am I going to have the need for life insurance to cover estate planning needs or estate equalization needs or charitable gifting goals that I have? So I may be reducing my insurance. I may be life insurance. I may be changing the character of it. It's probably a little premature for me, but in several years, maybe I start reviewing my disability insurance. Does it make sense to start to um, reduce my coverage a little bit or shorten the benefit period? Could some of those dollars be moved into long-term care? As my situation evolves, I'm gonna be thinking about all these things. And then when people finally hit that end stage, that independent phase, and, and really from, from my perspective, Miles, this is when you're retired. This is when you have no more earned income. So disability is kind of the low hanging fruit at that point. If I don't have any earned income, do I really need disability insurance, which is designed to replace my income? I don't. Again, revisiting the insurance. What, or, I'm sorry, the life insurance. What are my needs for, um, you know, potentially providing for, you know, children or a spouse, or does that flip into, estate type issues or charitable type issues. And that's when you probably want to get really, really serious about long-term care. But I guess the, the point is everybody goes through these stages differently. Um, they go through them at different times. They go through them at different ages and different, at different speeds. And the goal is to really just 
constantly be reevaluating your needs and then matching those needs to the type of insurance you own or or how you own the insurance. So again, that's the reason why we're always talking about these items. And you really, I think one that I, I've seen, I actually I wish I didn't see this as, as much as I, I do. Um, and yet again, this is when I'm meeting with somebody that's new. The amount of disability insurance policies that are still in place after someone retires, that's an easy one that should be canceled the, the day you're done working. And I think and oftentimes the reason that it's missed is there's, I, I, yet again, I, I kind of hate to keep sounding like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just a broken record here, but it's having that process in place to review the types of insurance that you have. I think there's a misconception about that process that it's designed to sell you more insurance. When we run that analysis, the hope is that you need no more insurance, right? We don't want you to have to have any more cash outlays for this, but it's also to ensure that things like this don't get missed because um, they can be quite costly. If you've had one in place for you know, three or four years after you've retired um, and you do the math on what you, you've you been paying for this thing and if something would have happened, you would have received nothing anyways, it's costly and it adds up. And I think that that's something that is often is missed. Um, also with this retirement stage, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been significant changes to the tax code and how wealth will transfer from the current retiring generation to the next generation. And I don't think enough people realize this, but you know, if you're over the age of 67, you, collectively, you are part of the, the most wealthiest generation in American history. The IRS is aware of this. They, keep, they have all the numbers. They know where the money's at. And so as you watch the tax codes adjust and change, there has now been this massive shift to, well, now when you pass away, we're going to make sure we collect that money. So think about it this way. If you were my age today, 60 or 50 years, 40 years ago, and you started with a 401k plan or, or an IRA, traditional IRA, you were putting that money in pre-tax, means you don't pay any tax at that time money grows tax-free. Well, when the IRS was doing all these initial calculations and trying to figure out how do we help Americans better prepare for retirement so they're not as dependent you know, on the government to provide benefits, it's really hard to look at causalities, meaning what's the causality or, or the causation of making a rule today and what it will impact tomorrow? Well, now the IRS was seeing what that impact actually was. And that impact was that they were collecting far less tax revenue than they were projecting when they put these rules in place eons ago. And so what was happening was under the old rule prior to the SECURE Act, which was passed in 2019, at the end of 2019, if you passed away and you left a pre-taxable account to a beneficiary that was not your spouse, they had the ability to take that RMD, that required minimum distribution that you were taking while you were retired over the rest of their lifespan. And it was relatively a small amount. You figure if you were 80 years old, pass that to somebody that's, that's 50, their life expectancy table is probably around 30 years, maybe 30 plus years. So it's a relatively small factor initially. So what the IRS projected they were going to collect over your lifetime just got extended almost double. Well, if that's happening to everyone that's in that generation that's 67 and older, they're going to have a tax crunch problem. And so to help solve this issue, what they've done is they said, now, if you pass away with a pre-taxable account, you leave it to a beneficiary. That beneficiary does not get to spread that money out over their entire life. Now, they have to take it out over 10 years. So now, if you pass $300,000 to somebody, today, they've now got to take out about 30000 or more every single year until that account is exhausted. But they're also still working. Now their taxable income has gone up substantially. And so when we look at that kind of that transitioning of insurance needs, this is becoming a talking point for policies that are already in place and maybe reasons to either keep them, reasons to maybe keep them and reduce the death benefit so no more premium payments are needed, um, at the same time, it's, you know what, I have some clients that even tell me, look, I love my family, I love the beneficiaries, but not my concern, Miles, they're on their own. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's my dad's motto. My, my dad tells me last day, last dollar, and I tell him all the time, 
that I'm not waiting for anything to happen to you. So, so spend it. That's that's the goal here. You you saved all this money. We want you to spend it. But that that's on everyone's goal. And so I, I think that's something that's uh, oftenly overlooked. Um, back to my example earlier you know, in today's webinar. Money is complicated, and it's going to become more complicated. Do we think the IRS is going to have more or less shortfalls in the future? I think the answer there is yes. If the answer to that is yes, that means the tax rules are going to get more complicated and they're going to try to find ways to raise tax revenue. Um, it's very black and white to Brad and I and the, and the team here at Fort Pitt because we're in this world every day. But unless you're in it every single day, you probably don't realize the impact this is going to have on your wealth. And more importantly, you put money away and didn't spend it to utilize it later or pass it on. Well, if the government's taking a substantial amount of that, that kind of defeats the whole purpose, right? Probably maybe spend it. So we wanna make sure we address all of these concerns you know, as you're kind of shifting and changing throughout your life. And dealing with an evolving landscape. You know, that's, 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 you know, that's in there too. So Miles, are we at a point to um, maybe address some questions? Absolutely. Yes. So this is this is the point now where we want to give everybody some time that's on the webinar today. Um, ask away. Ask your questions. Uh, there there are no bad questions. I, I can I can assure you. For as long as I've been doing you know webinars and and group sessions, typically if one person has that question, multiple people have that question. So you know while Brad and I are here, we want to make sure that you know, we make the best use of of everyone's time and, and we can provide you answers as they as they come up. Yeah. And Miles, I'll just give the disclaimer that because insurance is such a personal topic, um, if there are things that, you know, really just don't lend themselves to a group setting, we're happy to chat one on one with somebody. We're just I'm just waiting to see if any questions pop up here. All right, it doesn't appear we have any questions today. So the hope is that we, we've answered a lot of the questions that, that maybe were on people's mind. Um, so we'll, we're gonna end the webinar here today, but before everybody goes, we just wanna let you all know that we're gonna be having some upcoming webinars here. Um, Brad, let me flip to that screen. Um, our next webinar is gonna be on August 3rd at 12 p.m. And it's gonna be addressing financial planning you know, and a guide to building wealth. Perfect. And I just want to say, you know, thank you to everybody who attended um, and for the people who, who weren't able to attend today that will listen to the rebroadcast. Um, you know, we're really pleased to be able to provide this series of webinars and anything that we can do to be helpful. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, like Miles said, there's no such thing as a bad question, even after the fact. Um, happy to help in any way we can but but thank you again for attending today yes yeah, same here thank you all for for taking the time out of your out of your day to, to sit with brad and i and, and talk about insurance and, and same thing to his point if you had any point have questions or maybe if something just doesn't feel right and you just need a second set of eyes to look at something we'll gladly provide that to you um, we don't charge to do that you know we're part of the pittsburgh community um so if you're local and you do have questions please reach out to us. We're here to help. And even if you're not, um, still reach out to us. Like I said, we want to make sure we're able to provide people with meaningful solutions, even if that means they don't work with us. That's okay. That's fine. But um, our, our number one goal is to help you avoid mistakes because it's the mistakes that are end up end up being ultimately the most costly. Miles in the Harrisburg Central PA community too, right? That's right. And then here's our disclosure uh, for today's presentation. Miles, thanks for taking the time to do this with me. I think it was great. Same here, Brad. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.